All right. Hello again. Um, hey, one more thing I want to mention to you uh, in regard to Save Our City. Um, we're going to have a 24-hour uh, time of prayer leading up to Save Our City. So from Wednesday afternoon until Thursday afternoon, we're going to have 24 hours of just united prayer, asking God to move and power, asking God to move in the lives of people to transform and change people. So I want to invite you to be a part of the 24 hours of prayer. We're going to have the auditorium open so you can come pray here physically. There, there's something about the focus of being in a specific place and a specific time to help our prayers. Sometimes we sign up and say, yeah, I'll pray, but then we get busy doing the dishes or doing the laundry. So we're going to have the auditorium open so you can be here. We'll have different people leading each of those times all the way through the night, okay? And so some of you who are night owls, sign up for those like, you know, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. slots. We need you here, okay? And, um, and help us uh, join together to be united in prayer, asking God to move and do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So you can uh, snap a picture of the QR code and it'll take you uh, to a place where you can register to be a part of 24 hours of prayer. Um, you can find it on the website or on the Freeway Orlando website as well. And we'll, we'll continue to let you know and, and invite you to be a part of this. But uh, let's, let's pray together and ask God to move through our save our city service, okay? All right, well, we're going to continue our series today uh, called The Values That Guide Us. And so for the last two weeks, we have been talking about the values that guide us as a church. So I want to put all seven values on the screen. I want to read them one more time. And the first one is pray first. Everybody say pray first. Pray first. Grow biblically. Everybody say grow biblically. Last week we talked about biblical growth. Biblical growth is called discipleship. And so we talked about what that looks like. If you weren't here, you could go back on the uh, church website and check out that message. Today we're going to talk about embrace community. Everybody say embrace community. Embrace. Number four, serve joyfully. Everybody say serve joyfully. Don mentioned Team Sunday, and on Team Sunday, on August 25th, we're going to have an opportunity for you to serve and, and uh, become a part of one of our ministry teams here at Orlando Baptist Church. So uh, if you've been wondering, how do I get involved, how do I serve, be here August 25th, and we'll find you a spot. Number five, live generously. Everybody say that. Live generously. Number six, share the gospel. Everybody, yep. And number seven, glorify God. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about what it means to embrace community, to embrace community. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture out of the book of Philippians. Uh, the apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians to a church in a city called Philippi. We're going to look at a kind of a big chunk of scripture starting in Philippians 1 verse 21, all the way through the end of Philippians chapter 2. So we're going to look at that together in just a minute. But Paul wrote this letter to a real church, just like Orlando Baptist Church is a real church. And we meet in a real place, 500 South Cimarron Boulevard, Orlando, Florida, 32807. A real church in a real place in a real time. And Paul wrote the letter to the church at Philippi, which met in a real place, at a real time with real people. The, God's word, scripture is not just kind of a fairy tale or written to some um, arbitrary make-believe people. It's written to real people in a real place, in a real time, and they have names and they had experience just, just like you have names and experiences. And so Paul is writing to this church in this city called Philippi. Philippi was in Greece. And it was the first church on the European continent uh, that was founded in the days of the early church. And so Paul writes them this letter, uh, but in order to kind of get the background of this church in Philippi, um, later on, if you want to, I'm not going to do it right now, but Acts chapter 16, okay? If you go and read Acts chapter 16, then you will see the history and of the founding of the church at Philippi. So Paul and his, uh, his fellow missionaries, they roll up to the city of Philippi. They sail in, they get to port, they get out, and they go uh, to find some people to worship with. 
And the city of Philippi did not have a synagogue, a, a place of Jewish worship like many of the other cities did where they had ministered. And so they went down by the river uh, and they met a woman named Lydia. And Lydia was wealthy. She was a merchant. She sold purple dyes. She sold really fashionable clothes, okay? Lydia was a fashionista. She would have had like, you know, she would have had like fashion tutorials on YouTube if, if she were alive today. She was a real person, real place, real time. And as Lydia and some other women heard Paul and the missionaries with him talking about the gospel, they said, we want to know more about this gospel. And they gave their life to Christ. They were baptized. They went to Lydia's house and baptized all of her family and household. And she became the first believer in the city of Philippi. And she said, if you consider me a believer, then make my house your base of operations. And so Lydia's house became the meeting place of the church in Philippi. Real place, real people, real time. Paul and his uh, fellow missionaries went out and they were preaching the gospel in the streets of Philippi. And as they were preaching, there was a, there was a young lady who was enslaved. She was owned in slavery to these men that were using her to tell the future. Scripture says she was possessed by a demon and that gave her the ability to, to tell the future. And so people would pay these men and they would exploit her in order to make money. And as Paul is walking through the city, this young slave girl who is possessed by a demon says, this man is a servant of the most high God. And she kept following him around. And finally, Paul turned around and told the demon to come out of her. And it did. And she was delivered spiritually. And now these men who had used her and exploited her didn't have any use for her anymore. And they were really mad at Paul because he just took away their hope of making a profit. But this young woman became a part of the church at Philippi. This girl who had no money, who had no family, who had no hope, all of a sudden is, is brought into the family of God in the church at Philippi. And now she's over there hanging out with Lydia, who was this wealthy woman, this, this seller of fine clothing. And now this little street girl who was in raggedy clothes, who had no money, who had no family, had a family. And her and Lydia were sisters all of a sudden. And because of that, because Paul cast the demon out of this slave girl, the, the slave owners got him thrown into jail. And Paul and Silas and the other missionaries were in jail and it was the midnight hour and they were singing praises. They were worshiping Jesus. They were singing, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. And as they sang, scripture says that the, the gates of that prison flung open and the chains came off their arms and came off their legs. And they just kept singing, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. And as they were singing and as they were worshiping, they were delivered, they were, they were set free, but they didn't leave. And so the jailer, he was afraid that all the prisoners were gonna run away. And when the prisoners run away, he was gonna get in trouble. And so he was about to take his own life because he thought I might as well take my own life because once the prisoners get out, my bosses are gonna take my life. And Paul says, hey man, slow down, we're still here. And because of, of this community of believers living out their faith in the midst of a difficult circumstance, this blue collar, former military, tough guy fell down at their knees and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And so he took Paul to his house and Paul shared the gospel with his family and they got saved too and they all got baptized. And guess what? They got to be a part of that church at Philippi. And now you got Lydia, the wealthy merchant, and you got the poor slave girl who doesn't even have a name. And you got the blue collar ex-military jailer and his family. And they're all together in one place as one church and one body, real people, real place, real time. Okay, and so Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi and he's got those folks in mind as well as many others who had come to faith and become a part of this thriving church family. Different people, different backgrounds who are called together as children of God. And so we're gonna read in, in Philippians chapter one, we're gonna start in verse 21. And we're gonna talk about what it means to embrace community. 
Now, as I read this text, you're not going to immediately go, oh, embrace community, I get it, okay? But we're going to look at some principles that Paul is laying out in this passage, and then we're going to see how it comes together to help us understand what it means to embrace Christian community. So let me pray, and then we'll get into the scripture together this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your salvation. Lord, we ascribe to you the glory due your name this morning. Lord, I pray as we look at your word that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear and see what you have for us today. I pray that you would help us to value deeply the reality of Christian community, that we would embrace it, that we would live in it, that we would walk in it, that we would surrender our lives to the kind of community that you call us to, that we would live selflessly and sacrificially, that as your people, we would exalt your name. And so, Lord, speak to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, let me read Philippians 1, 21 through 26. Here's what Paul says to the church at Philippi. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that... Because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Paul is reminding us of two truths right here. First, he says, hey, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as someone who is born again, who has placed your faith in Jesus Christ, heaven is your home. And it is far better than anything we will ever experience here on earth. This morning, Bob and Karis and Robert Caraballo are sitting back here, and um, Bob's wife and Karis and Robert's mom, Carla, went home to be with Jesus last night in the wee hours of the night. She had been suffering for a couple of years, but for the last several weeks, really, really struggling at the hospital. And she breathed her last breath on this side of heaven and breathed her next breath in the presence of Jesus. We praise the Lord for that. And we also come along this family side and love them and grieve with them and weep with them. But Paul reminds us in this passage that for a believer in Jesus Christ, this is not the end of the story. Heaven is our future. And he says, I want to be with Christ. That is far better than anything I will experience in this life. But he says... I've got work to do right now in this body of flesh that God has given me. In this real place with real people in a real time, in the church at Philippi, in the church at Orlando Baptist Church, 500 South Cimarron Boulevard, we've got work to do. And God has put us here for a reason. And as long as he keeps us here, we've got work to do in the community of faith. So Paul talks about this reality of, of our future home in heaven, but our present reality here on earth, and he's called us to do good work while we're here. And so the first thing I want us to see about Christian community this morning is that Christian community takes place in the real world. Christian community takes place in the real world. Paul says, heaven is my home, but while I'm here in the real world, I've got work to do. God is, has given us the church, um, our local churches, our local bodies where we gather in community while we live here on earth as aliens and strangers, Scripture says, waiting for the day that he will call us home because in heaven, by the way, there will be perfect community. There won't be a bunch of different churches. There will be one body, the body of Christ, gathered together from every nation, tribe, and tongue, crying out together, worthy, 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 holy, holy, holy. 
But in the meantime, while we're here on earth, we're called together in community in the real world. So what does that mean to be in the real world? Well, it means it's real people with real problems, with real attitudes, <laughs> right? With real hurts and real pains, real relationships, real sin, real struggles. And God has called us to minister in the midst of the real hurts and the real pains and the real struggles of the real world. And we do that in Christian community. And because of all of the real hurts and real pains and real struggles and real sins and real, all that stuff that we experience, that I experience, that you experience, we need each other. We need each other. Look at your neighbor and say, we need each other. So we live in the real world. And that also means Christian community is not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to forgive each other and it's not easy to love each other and it's not easy to be patient with each other. And it's not easy to bear one another's burdens and it's not easy to, to forgive one another and restore one another. That stuff's not easy because we live in the real world with real hurt, real pain, real sin, all those things. But in the midst of that, we are called into community together. It also means that we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the real world. That we get to be the presence of Jesus who gives somebody a hug. We get to comfort people in Jesus' name. We get to walk with people through hard times in Jesus' name. This is a crazy truth, but it's a truth. God will use you in Christian community to be the answer to somebody's prayer. Somebody will be saying a prayer, God, I'm, I'm struggling, Lord. I'm, I'm in need. I have, I have a financial need. I have a relational need. And, and God might prompt you and lead you to, to step into that situation and to be an agent of his peace in their life, in the real world. That's part of what Christian community is. We get to walk alongside the Caraballo family in the real world through real hurt and real pain and speak and bring the comfort and peace of Jesus in their life. Real Christian community takes place in the real world. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's talking about as we live our life in the real world, the way we love each other will define who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Christian community takes place in the real world. And so we can't, maybe you've heard this phrase, that, that someone is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. <laughs> I've met people who say, um, you know, I just can't wait for Jesus to come blast all these people. Maybe you've thought that a time or two. There was two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, who said that one time. And Jesus said, guys, knock it off. <laughs> That's not why I'm here. That day is coming, but until then, we want to point people to the love and grace and goodness of Jesus. And some of us, we're, we're, we're not engaged in the real world anymore. And Paul says, look, I can't wait for heaven. I cannot wait to see Jesus face to face, but I got work to do. And hey, I can't wait to see Jesus face to face either. But in the meantime, we've got work to do with each other and the world around us. Christian community takes place in the real world world. But then he continues and he says this in verse 27. <coughs> Just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. 
not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. Paul, at the beginning of this passage, he says, hey, just one thing, don't forget that you are citizens of heaven. You are citizens of heaven. Christian community takes place among the citizens of heaven or among born-again believers. If you remember uh, earlier this year, we did a series called Saints Together. We talked about the reality that when we are in Christ, we are saints. We are no longer in sin, but we are in Christ. And because of that, we are saints. That means we have been born again. We were dead in our sins, but we were given new life through Christ. That's what it means to be a born again believer. And, and when we became born again, we, we became a citizen of heaven. We have a new identity. We are a new creation, scripture says. We're no longer identified by this world. We're no longer identified by our race or the color of our skin. We're no longer identified by our wealth or by our success. We're no longer identified by our family of origin. We're no longer identified by the country that we live in. We're no longer identified by any worldly measures. We are identified as children of God, adopted as God's children, born again, believers, citizens of heaven. And so as citizens of heaven, when we get caught up in all of the other identities, it messes things up. It gets real confusing. In Christian community, we are first brothers and sisters in Christ. Before we're anything else, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We don't have to speak the same language. We don't have to have the same inside jokes. We don't have to have the same preferences. We are born again, saints together. We are citizens of heaven. It continues, it says that we should stand together, contending together for the faith. Christian community is united around the gospel. Christian community is united around the gospel. We're standing firm for the faith of the gospel. Again, when we don't understand that we are citizens of heaven first, we're living in the real world, but we are citizens of heaven. When we don't understand that, then we start to unite around other things. We start to unite around politics. And we put our hope in who the next president is instead of King Jesus. We start to unite around musical preferences. I like this kind of music and that church doesn't sing that kind of music. Their drum's a little bit too loud or their, their music's a little too boring or that pastor, he wears jeans and he doesn't wear a suit or, you know, we get caught up in all the stuff. Right, we begin, we begin to unite around other things instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Christian community is united around the gospel. At this, at Orlando Baptist Church, we want to be united around the gospel. We don't need all that other nonsense. We're united around the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the way, the gospel, not just faith. The gospel is distinct from faith. Everybody's got faith. We're not just people of faith, though we are people of faith, but that's not the end of the story. Our faith has got to be in the right thing. Not just some generic faith that makes you feel good and gives you warm, fuzzy feelings. We need a faith that saves us. And the only faith that saves us is faith in the gospel. The gospel says you were dead in your sins. You deserved punishment. You deserved hell. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he loved us with, made us alive through Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace. That's the gospel. 
And we got to be united around the gospel. Christian community takes place in the real world among born-again believers who understand that they are citizens of heaven and the thing that unites us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christian community also provides encouragement for believers. I don't know about you, but I need to be encouraged often. It's easy for me to get down in the dumps when I'm on my own. How many of y'all ever got stuck in your head before? Anybody? Yeah. And we need encouragement. We need somebody to say, hey, get out of there. What are you doing, man? We need encouragement. We need brothers and sisters in Christ around us to encourage us, to, to cheer us on. This passage says that when we stand for the truth of the gospel, we will have enemies. We live in a world that hates truth. That is the spirit of this age. They say, Who do you think you are telling me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Who do you think you are telling me that God's word says I can't have sex with this person? Who do you think you are telling me that I can't live however I want to live? Don't tell me that. People hate the truth because the truth messes us up. And so as we stand for truth, we need somebody to come alongside and encourage us to keep standing for the truth. Not to be right, but to be loving and gracious. Because here's what the rest of this passage says. Don't be frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. Christian community provides encouragement for believers, but it provides a warning and an invitation for the world. As we live in the truth, as we live in Christian community, as we love one another, as we live sacrificially and selflessly, as we unite around the gospel and not other nonsense, people who are outside of the truth, though they may reject it, they see it for what it is. And it is a warning to them, turn from trying to find your own truth and turn to the truth. And it is also an invitation that says, hey, you don't have to find your own truth. The truth and the way and the life is trying to find you. Turn to him. When we live in Christian community, it's a warning to the world of God's justice and judgment, but it's also an invitation to the world that you can be a part of the community of the saints, that you can be a child of God, that you can be born again. Christian community takes place in the real world among born again believers who are united around the gospel, provides encouragement for the believers, it provides a warning and an invitation to the world. Let me read the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. If then... There is any encouragement in Christ? It's a rhetorical question. If there is any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but to the interest of others. Paul starts this off. He says, hey, if you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ, if you've experienced the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, then live this way. We see at the beginning of this that Christian community flows out of the love of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Christian community flows out of the love of Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The love of Christ is what initiates a relationship with God. We don't seek God on our own. Scripture says there is none righteous, no, not one. There is not even anybody who seeks him. But Jesus initiated the search and rescue mission when he came in human flesh. 
And because of his love and his grace, he calls us to himself. And when we respond in faith, we are adopted into the family of God. And we are united as a community of believers. But Christian community flows out of that love of Christ and out of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit who, who reminds us, you are mine, you are mine, you are mine. Who draws us together. Christian community flows out of the love of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. This passage also reminds us that Christian community is self-forgetting and self-giving. Paul says, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, and ten on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Self-forgetting and self-giving. I use the phrase self-forgetting on purpose. I, I started with the word selfless, but I changed it to self-forgetting. There's a little, great little pamphlet called the, um, the gift of self-forgetfulness uh, that, that I've read and I've given to many people that, that helps us understand that, uh, that part of what being selfless is is just forgetting about yourself, just thinking of yourself less. Doesn't mean thinking less of yourselves. It doesn't mean that you're a doormat. <clears throat> Just means you're not occupied with thoughts about yourself all the time. That's crushing anyway. Like that will crush you. Self-forgetting and self-giving. Paul says, look, consider others as more important than yourselves. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. Christian community is self-forgetting and self-giving. I mean, what would it look like? Just in the world, what would it look like? In the world that we live in, the, the craziness of the world that we live in, whether it's the cultural moment right here in the United States, whether it's wars that are happening in the Middle East or in Europe, what would, it happen, what would happen if people really were self-forgetting and self-giving? What would that look like? What would a community of people who really thought of other people as more important than themselves, what would that look like? I mean, it would be, it would be incredible. It would be radical. It would be heaven <laughs> one day. That's what it's gonna look like. And Jesus says, as you are a representative of the kingdom of heaven right now on earth, living in the real world, but a citizen of heaven, then I want you to embrace the values of heaven, that you would love each other sacrificially, that you would give of yourself to others, that you would put other people's preferences ahead of your own. I mean, in this room of 300 or so people, however many people are in here, just what if we live that way every day consistently? How would that change this room? How would it change our communities? How would it change the people around us? How would it change our families? Christian community is self-forgetting and self-giving. Then he continues, Philippians chapter two, starting in verse five. And he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Two things from this little chunk of scripture. Christian community models the sacrificial love of Christ Jesus. Paul gives us the example of Christ. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who came and who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And as 
Paul is writing to the church of Philippi, and as Scripture speaks to us today and invites us to live self-forgetting and self-sacrificial lives, as it invites us to, to live the values of the kingdom and the real world as citizens of heaven, it calls us to do so because of the example of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus already lived that kind of life for us. And when we live that way in Christian community, it is a model of Christ's love to the world. It shines a light on Jesus Christ, his grace and his love and his mercy. But secondly, the end of this passage, it says, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we live that way, Christian community exalts King Jesus. Christian community exalts King Jesus. Lifts up the name of Jesus, lifts up the person of Jesus, lifts up the work of Jesus, lifts up the reality of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Christian community, we can do that way better than we can as individuals. We can accomplish more together than we can on our own. When we're living out the values of the kingdom, when we're living out the, the love and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ as a community, man, that amplifies the message of the gospel. It amplifies the message of Jesus Christ. It exalts the name of Jesus Christ. When we gather as a group and we sing, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forever more for endless days we will sing his praise oh lord oh lord our god when we exalt the name of jesus in community we declare his glory to a world that is watching which brings us to the last section philippians 2 verses 12 through 18 paul continues therefore my dear friends just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So do everything without grumbling and arguing. That's pretty straightforward. That's the hardest verse in here, by the way. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I, Paul, can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even as I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul uses this phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the process of discipleship. That's what we talked about last week. It's biblical growth. It's growing in our salvation. He's not saying that you work out for salvation. No, salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then when we are saved, we live out that salvation. We work out our salvation. We grow in the understanding of our salvation. We grow in our understanding of what it means to be a child of God. We grow in our understanding of what it means to be a part of the community of believers in the world. And the, the verse here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, is in the context of Paul talking about how we live together putting others' needs before your own. Live out the same attitude as Jesus Christ, who served others, who was obedient. And so this phrase, live, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it, it's in the context of Christian community. In, in American culture, we are so individualistic that we love to take verses like this and think that we, I'm, I'm over here doing my individual exercise and I'm stronger than all those other Christians. Look at me working out my salvation with fear and trembling. No, he's saying, y'all, <laughs> work out your salvation together with fear and trembling. 
Thursday mornings for the last couple of weeks, a group of men have gathered to pray together at Starbucks on Michigan. And I love praying with those guys. And when I pray with them and when I read God's word with them and when I do Bible studies and pray and learn with other believers, I understand God better. Because God gives all of us different insights and different wisdom and we have different life experiences that we bring. And when we bring those things together, we understand God more, we grow more. And as I'm working out my salvation, I need a workout partner. <laughs> we need each other. So Christian community is a vital part of discipleship and spiritual growth. Christian community is a vital part of discipleship and biblical growth. You cannot do it by yourself. You cannot. You will not grow into the person that God designed you to be if you're trying to do it on your own. You just can't. You won't do it. You need a Christian community. So as you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you do that in community. Here's the next thing from this section. And I'm wrapping up, I promise. Christian joy should produce, Christian community should produce joy instead of grumbling. Remember that verse? And honor instead of complaining. The end of this passage, Paul talks about honoring people who live this way. The reason we grumble is because we're not experiencing the joy of the Lord in our lives. And so we grumble about this thing or that thing or this challenge or that challenge. We need to experience the joy of the Lord. And complaining or arguing in verse 14 is, it's about our interactions with other people. Grumbling is just kind of my muttering under my, but complaining or arguing, that's when I can't get along with my brothers and sisters, the other people of God. And Paul's remedy to that is to honor other people, to see in them God's work in their life and to celebrate that and to honor that. Mac got to share his testimony at Freeway last night. And Mac, I'm so excited about all that God is doing in your life. And I honor what God is doing in your life. And that's what we have to do. We have to see what God is doing in other people's lives. Maybe they're not growing as fast as we want them to grow, but they're growing. So honor that. Say, man, I'm proud of you. I'm praying for you. I believe in you. God is doing a work in you. I'm praying for you. Instead of complaining and arguing and grumbling. Christian community should produce joy instead of grumbling, honor instead of complaining. And then Paul says that if you do that, everything without grumbling and complaining, you are blameless and pure children of God who shine like stars in the world. Christian community shines the light of Christ into a dark world. If we as the people of God living in the real world with real problems, real pains, real hurts, real headaches, real frustrations, real conflict, if we can love each other self-giving, self-sacrificing, self-forgetting, if we can love each other that way, if we can encourage each other in our spiritual growth, if we can stand unified around the gospel, these things that we talked about today, then we shine the light of Jesus in an incredible way. I, I say it all the time, but I, wanna, I want us to be the kind of church that people walk in the room and they go, what are these people doing together? Why are these people together? It doesn't make any sense that, that this group of people are in the same place at the same time in the same room. They don't look the same. They don't think the same. If they were just out in the world, they would not be friends. But that's when the gospel is the loudest. When we are living in the reality that we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, citizens of heaven, when we can identify around that truth and that reality instead of all of the other things that would divide us. They, those are tools of Satan. <laughs> those, are, those are his tools. He's the one who divides.
but what if we loved each other, if we were unified around the gospel? Christian community takes place in the real world among born-again believers who are united around the gospel, providing encouragement for believers and a warning and invitation to the world. Christian community flows out of the love of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit in a way that is self-forgetting and self-giving, modeling the sacrificial love of Christ Jesus. Christian community is a vital component of discipleship and biblical growth. It should produce joy instead of grumbling, honor instead of complaining. Christian community exalts King Jesus and shines his light into a dark world. I want to give my life to that. And so as a church, we want to embrace community. This is what community means. Today, maybe you're here and, and, and you're not a part of the community of believers because you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ the Savior. The gospel says we're sinners, we stand condemned before God, but Jesus came to pay for our sin by dying on a cross and rising from the dead three days later. It's what we sang about earlier. And when we put our faith in his death and resurrection and turn from our sins and turn to him, we will be saved. And today, maybe, maybe you need to come to a place of faith and repentance and surrender. And when you do, you become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. What is the new? Well, you're welcomed into a brand new family with brand new values and a brand new identity. And when we live out that identity and those values together, the name of Jesus is exalted and people are drawn to him. And so we want to embrace community. We're gonna stand and sing in just a minute. And as we do, you have an opportunity to respond. You can come down here to the front and pray if you want to. Maybe you've been doing a lot of grumbling and complaining and arguing and you just need to come and confess that to the Lord. Maybe you have allowed yourself to be divided by all of the trivial things of this world instead of being unified around the gospel. And maybe you just need to come and talk to the Lord about that. Maybe there's a person in this room that you just need to go say, I love you and I'm sorry. Maybe today you need to come and put your faith in Jesus Christ so that we can be a place that embraces community for the glory of God. Stand up with me. God, we love you this morning. Thank you that Jesus Christ came became obedient to death, even the death of the cross for our salvation. So Lord, I pray for anyone in this room today who does not know you as Savior, that they would respond, that they would surrender and bow their knee to you and accept your free gift of salvation. Lord, I pray for the believers in here who have, who have not been living in Christian community, who have not embraced community Maybe they hold people at arm's length. Maybe they're trying to work out their own salvation by themselves. Maybe grumbling and complaining. Maybe distracted by the trappings of this world. But Lord, help us, help us, help us to be a church that embraces Christian community so that we can shine your light and exalt the name of Jesus in the world. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. As God is calling you, I invite you to respond.